Hey, I want to give you a, just a real quick, I just want to interrupt your conversation for about 30 seconds. So we're going to sing a new song this morning, but toward the end, just so you know, when I turn around and say, let's sing, that's your cue, okay? Didn't want to surprise you like, what's he doing, right? We want to, yeah. So when we turn around, it's your turn to sing, okay? So be ready. All right, go back and you can talk to your neighbors. We got in a couple minutes before we're starting.
Lord says, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. That is the God who we serve. He is the ruler over the nations, and we get to sing to him, and we get to worship him together. So let's sing to him across the lands. I would like to say good morning to you. Good morning. How are we doing, everybody? Doing good? We are so thankful that we get to worship today. It's been a wonderful weekend as we've been celebrating uh, the mission that God has given us as a local church, and we get to do something uh, with this mission. We get to celebrate uh, a baby dedication right now, actually this whole family dedication. We, we have a lot of different ways that you can say this or, or do this, but today really what we're about is uh, having the family come up here and be able to say that we are not only going to pray for you in this moment, but we are partnering with you for the evangelism and the discipleship of this next generation. And so even what we're singing about across the lands and taking the gospel, what we're about to do is a part of that as we think about the children that will be raised up here. So I'm going to ask the Andersons, why don't you guys come on up here uh, for us, and you're going to completely not even pay attention to me after you see all this glorious cuteness about to walk up here. So... Right, Andrew? You're the one I'm talking about. All right, okay. Um, so, that's right. So, all right, 
you're going to come up there. That's fine. That's right. That's fine. Completely fine. Uh, if you haven't known, some of y'all need to watch Isabella and worship and get your groove on from there, okay? She's got some good moves that you need to learn from, okay? Just going to say, but um, we do want to go ahead and celebrate this. We have two wonderful family, uh, two additions here. She's right there. I know. Isn't she great? I know, I'm sorry. Hey. Uh, well, there you go. So as I was saying, we're going to do something sacred in this moment, but uh, we are so thankful. We've got, we've got extended family all up here. This is one big family church, but we are so thankful. You are so cute. You're my friend. You, I love you too. Can you give me a high five? Okay, fine. That's good. It's all good. You know, some pastors have this calming effect on people. I just get them riled up. There you go. So, um, but this is Andrew and Kate, and they are uh, wonderful parents, and we are celebrating today these two wonderful additions to their family. I'm going to start down here with Oliver. There you go. That she takes care of. See what I'm saying? They're not even listening to me. Are you going to come from? Never mind. Okay. So this is Oliver Jude, who was born in June, on June 20th. Uh, we were looking up and just look at this. Oliver's name means the olive tree. So you're supposed to grow up in fruitfulness. I know. And you're going to have like all these wonderful things that throughout the Bible, the olive tree always brought about peace and, and fruitfulness and dignity. Uh, and then uh, a wonderful thing that even with Jude, your middle name means praise. What a wonderful, strong name. And Isabel Sinclair, you are so wonderful, and you are just wide open. Isabel, did you know that your name means devoted to God? Did you know that? Did you know that? Yeah, it does. Your name means devoted to God. And, and for some of you that don't know this, um, there's a beautiful thing that when the Lord grabs a heart of a family for foster care and adoption, that um, we are getting to celebrate that this month, right? That everything comes official. So these guys um, are going from zero to two kind of quick here. But this is good news. Yeah. Um, and so just I, I want you guys to know this before we pray. Uh, well, Isabel's name means devoted to God. I can't think of a better name for a family who's come along and said that, you know what? However God brings children into our family, it's something that he does. And I want to make sure that you know that both of these children, the way that both of them came to the family, is something that only God can do. Only God can do. And uh, just so you're aware, you, you're not in, in the years to come as these children grow up, you're never to ask something like, well, is this your this type of child or this type of child? These are much their children, both of them the exact same. This is something that God has done. And so this is something that we celebrate as a family. Uh, and they had, they had said, we want you to, you know, it's fine to share that this is what obviously is going through the process because their hope is that you guys would not be the only ones in this church doing foster care and adoption. Izzy, that would be not your thing, right? You want more people to do it? Oh, yeah. yeah, all right. So <laughs> it's a great thing. So, um, But we, we do want to pray. And, and my thing is this, is that when we, when we do a dedication, we are dedicating these children, but we're really de dedicating the family. That this is something that we're saying, you guys, we believe, to be the primary evangelists and disciple makers, but we're going to come in and we're going to do our job to be those second and third vo voices in their lives uh, to come alongside them, and so what we want to, and so what I want to ask is that if you, as a church, would commit to pray, to love, to shepherd, to teach, to evangelize, to disciple, to love on this family, not only today, but in the years to come, if you would stand to your feet at this time, I would love to see that as we pray. <gasps> Look at all these people who love you. Do you see that? Isn't that great? So what we're going to do is we're going to pray, I want to invite you to pray with me as we uh, do dedicate this family to the Lord. Um, Lord, I, I just thank you so much for this family. I thank you for the Andersons. I thank you for the heart that they have for you, uh, for the heart that you have to care for uh, children. Uh, Lord, we thank you. Uh, these two are precious blessings, wonderful gifts, um, and we are so, so very thankful for them. Lord, I pray that you would give uh, these two just the ability to be able to evangelize and disciple, to care for. I pray for this extended family, the grandparents and the aunts and uncles and all the different ones that will be involved but as a church, Lord, that we would be the family of God coming along these two precious ones and be able to show them. Lord, I just pray that they would grow up thinking that the church, that the body of people are the people who love them so much, care for them, and teach them the way. So, Lord, we thank you for these two little arrows. Pray that we would sharpen them well. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said. Amen. We do have a uh, couple of certificates. Do you want, hey, check this out. I got gifts. Izzy. Ooh. No, 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 no. I'm taking this. This one is for you, okay? For you. I got this for you. Nobody else did, okay? 
And then this one, Oliver, you're, we're going to give this to mom, but here's some certificates uh, for you guys, just as ways to remember, and some notes in there we want to continue as you guys pray. Can we just uh, celebrate this family again? Thank you guys so much. We're going to ask our uh, ushers to come forward. We're going to start taking the offering here in just a moment. Let's continue to stand and let's rejoice together as we sing, okay? Let's continue. As you're clapping, cheer on our first and second graders as they make their way. First and second grade.
Well, if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. We are in day 57 of our Bible reading plan. We made it to the New Testament this week, so you guys are doing great. If you're just joining us and you go, I didn't even know we were reading through the Bible, guess what? You just joined in today on day 57. Jump in with us, and I'm going to do some of the reading for you today. And, uh, and the Bible reading is actually in your bulletin as you can continue to go with us because we think that the Word of God is so important for us to see as a big picture of what God is doing. So today we're going to get to the person of Jesus, which is kind of a centerpiece of the Bible, okay? So this is kind of a big deal as we're going to look at, but get to celebrate all that he has done, all that we get to celebrate and who that he is. So when we're looking at this, every week we've been looking at the context of this and continuing to look at, but as we're jumping in this passage, I wanted to uh, tell you this story that I read years ago in a um, book by David Platt called Radical. And then he talked about that the SS United States, that the ship that was built in the 1940s, was an $80 million boat that was built back in those days. That's, that's a lot of change there. And it was supposed to um, carry 15,000 troops overseas. And so that the way that it was done, it was spent so much money on them so they could get 15,000 soldiers in a boat, get it to where they needed to be in the quickest time possible. So it was a very, very fast ship. It was finished in 1952 and could travel about 51 miles per hour with all those kind of people in there. Pretty impressive. Once again, they had it staged that no matter where they needed to be, they could be within there in a few days. An incredible, wonderful piece of work that was supposed to take 15,000 troops to war whenever it needed to be. But they never made a trip like that. In fact, the boat changed from being a, 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 a troop carrier to a luxury liner. At the end of it, they basically changed, and instead of that, instead of carrying troops to the battlefield, it turned into a cruise line. And so instead of, if you, for those of you who have ever served in the military, you realize this, they're going to put you bunk bed after bunk bed after bunk bed. When you're trying to get a cruise ship uh, lined up, you can't really stack people like that, right? You've got to make a little bit more room and a little bit more luxurious spaces. And so in fact, not only this, uh, the ship, as they changed the function of it, it was no longer trying to get 15,000 troops in there, but they tried to get less than 2,000 very wealthy people to take any type of trip that they wanted to. And so for the years that the uh, SS United States was carried, it was able to be a luxury liner versus a troop carrier. And, and the point that in the book that he made that I think is very appropriate for us to do today is that what it had the function of was to be something that was a wartime vessel and it turned to accommodation and luxury. And the, the point that he was making is, is that so often what we can do in the church when we are supposed to go with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are supposed to be the salt and light to the earth, we are supposed to be on war against an enemy that is against the work that we are trying to do, and yet somehow we have turned what God meant to be a vessel for carrying soldiers, the church, to a luxury liner, to where it's all about our comforts. It's all about how, how happy we are. In fact, because if you really look at it, why do people leave this church and go to another church? A lot of times it may be, well, the color of the carpet, it might be the preacher, it might be the music, it might be the kids program. And I just want to let you know, if you are coming here because of the preacher, there are plenty better churches. Okay? <laughs> plenty. In fact, you know what? At one point, there's going to be somewhere that you come alongside and say, you know what? That church over there is more my musical taste than what, than, than, than what this church is. You're probably going to find some place that you'll say, you know what, the kids program I think is better than because it's a this versus that or whatnot. There's all kinds of things because you can go down this road and continue going and there's every option. There are people who are all the time saying, hey, come in our doors, come in our doors and we can do that. We want you here, but ultimately here's the reality. As the church of Jesus Christ, we are not meant to be a luxury liner trying to get people on a nice cruise ship. We are at war, ladies and gentlemen. And we have been enlisted by someone who even though our sins were many, his mercy was what? It's more than that. And so what I'm asking today is that as we look at who this person of Jesus Christ is, is that for each and every single one of us, we should say, if you truly have forgiven my sins, where wouldn't I go for you? What wouldn't I do for you? One of the hardest things for me and my wife to do sometimes when we actually are able to find that time to have a date night is we'll say, where do you want to eat? And 30 minutes later, we just drive around and drive around. Anybody there? You want to testify? And, and really what you're wanting to do is say, somebody just make the decision, right? I don't care. And I always, like me, like, I, I have no preference. I'll eat anything. It really doesn't matter. You put barbecue sauce on cardboard, I'd eat it, okay? Like, I can get it down, just whatever. But ultimately, here, here's, here's the goal today, is that at the end of this uh, service today is that we would look at the Lord Jesus and say, here are the keys. Where do you want to go? I'm in. I, I'm not asking you to be my co-pilot, like the old bumper sticker used to say. You're in charge. Here are the keys. Give them over to you. 
Where do you want to go? Where would you, like Isaiah in chapter 6, oh my goodness, one of my favorite passages of scripture, when all of a sudden he sees the Lord high and lifted up, right? And then all of a sudden he goes, oh no, my sins are going to undo me here. I'm not supposed to be here. And he gets forgiven of his sins. And then all of a sudden God looks out and goes, so who's going to go for us? And Isaiah goes, me. I'll go. And I go, time out, Isaiah. He hasn't said where you're supposed to go yet or how long you're going to be there or if there's air conditioning and bathrooms there. You need to calm down, Isaiah. You don't know what he's calling. All you know is who will go for me and you shot your hand up and said, here I am, send me. Don't you understand once you've been forgiven, it doesn't matter where the assignment is. Here are the keys. I'll go. And so, so today, that, that, that's our prayers. We look at the person of Jesus and what he's going to say in us. As if you're following along, taking the notes, let me give you a context of where we are in the passage. Here's the first thing. Since we could not make it to God, God came to us in the person of Jesus. Is that good news this morning? We could not make it to God. We tried all of our Tower of Babels. We tried to get up to where we could find our way to him to reach on our own efforts, and we could not. And so God knew this. He sent Jesus to come down, to take our place, and to come rescue us, sent on the best rescue mission in the world. Why do we go on missions? Because Jesus was the first missionary who left his home to come and reach out to us. And so when we look at this, this beautiful thought, and one of the things is he does, so Jesus comes on the scene, and once again, if, if you've been reading along in our Bible reading plan, you know, we, can we see the birth narratives? We celebrate that at Christmas. And then all of a sudden you're going along, and there's a couple other stories between birth and age 30, and you go, what was he doing? Preparing. And then when age 30 hit, remember what happened? He went and got baptized by John the Baptist, and then he went immediately to the, to the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. He did in 40 days what Israel could not do in 40 years. Passed every test, and he came out of the wilderness. He started preaching, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He started healing and doing all the miraculous things. People go, we've never seen anything like this. And so what does Jesus do? Next thing that he does, Jesus called a group of disciples together in order to model and to multiply kingdom living. That's what he was about. That's what he's about. He pulls these group of disciples together, and he's going to model what kingdom living looks like, and he wants to multiply it. So there's a lot of times it's going to be crazy as you continue to read through the Gospels. Jesus is going to have hundreds and thousands of people listening there, and all of a sudden the disciples go, Hey, Jesus, keep preaching. Okay, do something else. Do another miracle here. Because everybody's listening. He goes, Hey, let's go to a secluded place. Let me talk to you guys. What? There's a crowd. I know, but I need you 12 with me real quick. But everybody's waiting. Don't you understand it's about me multiplying within you what I'm doing here so that when I'm not here, it continues. And here's the, the process of what multiplication is all about is that we're pouring ourselves into it. So Jesus models this. He commands this to make disciples. And he gets these 12 guys together. I'm going to pour everything that I have into you guys. And you guys are going to go change the world. Did he pick the most um, noteworthy individuals that he could find? Yes or no? No, there's hope for me yet. <laughs> there's hope for some of you. He didn't pick the guys that you would think, but yet God changed the world through these men. And so when we get to this passage today, it's in the Sermon on the Mount, he articulated how a disciple's beliefs should determine a disciple's behavior. So he starts looking at, okay, as, as if you believe this, this is what it means. And he preaches this sermon that's contained in Matthew chapters 5 through 7 that we'll be reading today and we'll be reading tomorrow. That's the most quoted sermon in all of history. It's the most incredible sermon that you, we've ever seen because as he does this, he basically just completely ruins everybody's morality system. Oh, you've heard it said, uh, don't murder. That's right, we haven't murdered. Oh, if you have hatred in your heart, basically doing the same thing. Do what? And, and he just goes at everybody and said it. it's about the heart, but it's also about the behavior. And so we're going to read, we're going to start in verse 1. I'm just going to read just to get you the context, but we're going to really study verse 13. But I want you to get this because I just love even how he sets it up. It says, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. If you notice that, it's reverse of what we do today, right? I got to stand, y'all are sitting. In those days, Jesus just popped down, and everybody goes, Boy, what's he saying? And they get in the ear, and they get real close to him. And then I love verse 2. It sounds so dramatic. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, here it comes. Here we go. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In this moment, 
It almost sounds like he's saying, get ready. The world's going to be against you. And if you're going to be a part of my kingdom, you're going to have to separate yourself from them. That's what it sounds like is about to happen. It sounds like he's about to say, it's going to get so bad, they're going to persecute you so much. You need to go ahead and just get your group together and move away from them. Because everything they're going to do is going to come against you. And that's not what he says at all. Look what he says, verse 13. He flips it on them. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And so when he, he unpacks this about what it means to be salt and light, I, I love this passage, but what's beautiful about it, if, as, if we're just really thinking about how he says this, he does not say, if you do these good things, you will be my salt. If you do these good works, you will be my light. He says, you are my salt. You are my light. Therefore, this is how you need to act. That's why it's so important for us to remember that kingdom identity always precedes kingdom activity. Make sure you get this order. I don't know how many times I say it around here, but I'll keep saying it. Identity comes before activity. It's who you are that comes out of what you do. So when you are who this is, your identity, all of a sudden what you do flows out from that. It's not saying, I'm going to start doing these good works so that I can be this, so that I can be that. No, no, no. It's who you are, and that just sort of flows out from you, okay? So we've got three children. Our, our daughter, Gloria, who is five, she was born and brought into this world just who she is, her DNA. She is a hoarder to the T, okay? She just collects stuff, okay? She puts in piles. This morning, I was walking around the house. I stepped on some kind of animal that she had left there. You open up my book bag sometimes. She's put a baby in there, and I go, why is all this pinkness in my bag and she goes you never know when you're going to need a baby okay and I'm like I, I get that dear I understand that but she just collects stuff yesterday I tried to get my guitar off my stand but she had taken her little uh, toy horse and looped it around like the stand was now the stable and I was like honey daddy's got to get through the house but you just you can't teach her this she just collects stuff it's, it's who she is she just never knows rainy day I need something pink I need something squishy I need something comfy you know to hold on to is so that everything that she does it's always we're about to go on a trip Hey, I'm about to go to the, um, I, I, Gloria, all I got to do is go to the, the dump. I'll go with you. And I'm going, well, just come on with me. No, hold on. And all of a sudden, she's going to be bringing this bag. And here comes three babies and all this kind of other stuff. And just, that's just who she is. She don't have to teach her that. It just sort of flows out from her. And, and I'm telling you that because here's the reality. If you are a child of God, if you are one of his disciples, you don't try to manufacture your kingdom activity. It just flows from who you are. The more that you surrender to him, the more that he's changing your life, the more that you go, my sins, they were many, but his mercy is more. Sure, here are the keys. Yeah, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. Whatever you ask for me, it changes everything. What does Ephesians 2 tell us? It is for by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is what? It is the gift of God, not a result of what? Work so that no one may boast. For we are what? His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Here, here's the deal. You don't, you're not saved by good works. You're saved for good works. So I'm not doing good works to earn God's love. I'm not doing these things for God's love. I'm doing it from God's love. And so I want to make sure that you understand this. But also when he says in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. So there are these things called the singular and the plural. You all know what I'm talking about? Singular means one. Plural means more than that, right? So you may go, well, I don't know. Which is that you? You know, is this singular or plural? I'm glad you asked. It's plural. So really, if a southerner was interpreting this, he would say this. Y'all are the salt of the earth. Y'all are the light of the world. So you're like, I get this now. I finally understand the Bible, okay? Like, it is a plural form. And the reason why I want to emphasize this is that it's not on you to do the kingdom of God's work all by yourself. Thank the Lord that there's the body of Christ, that there's this hand going here and there's another hand going there. And so what he's saying is this. As a church, as a group of disciples, you all, all of you together, you are the salt of the earth. All of you, y'all, all together are the light of the world. Now, let's look at what he says again in verse 13 as it relates to salt. It says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So when he's talking about salt here, I brought up here a salt shaker for this. The idea, obviously, back in the day, and, and you may have heard different passages preached about this and what salt's supposed to do. I've heard every kind of um, 
you know, application of, well, salt, what it does is if, you know, if, you put, if I put it on my tongue right now, it makes me thirsty. And, like, and so what we're supposed to be in the earth is to make people thirsty for God. All right, it's not bad. I, I get that. And some people say, you know what, it brings flavor to the food, and the world's so dull, you Christians bring flavor. Some of you, you do bring a lot of flavor to everywhere you go. I get that. Some, some of it's like, hey, it, it's salt to a wound, and when there's injury, it's hard, and different things. But really, primarily, in Jesus' day, when he says you are the salt of the earth, salt was all about preservation. So it was all about preservation. So that, because obviously they didn't have all these refrigerants and all these different things to keep the food okay, so you'd pour the salt on the food, you'd pour the salt in different ways, knowing that you could be okay. So as salt's primary purpose was preservation, Christian's presence is meant to preserve the earth from further sinful decay. That's the idea. So if salt is coming in to try to make sure that the, the meat can last longer, he's basically saying this, in the same way, Christians, that's what's supposed to happen. You're supposed to keep this earth going longer than what it probably should. So when sin happens in the Garden of Eden, all of a sudden the ground is cursed, man is cursed, woman is cursed, things got a little out of hand. Would you agree with that? Have you looked at the news lately? Is it getting out of hand? Absolutely. And so what are Christians supposed to be? We are supposed to be the salt that is in the earth preserving it. Because it would be spoiled if it, without the presence of the, the salt of the earth coming in here. We're supposed to keep this thing at least afloat for a little bit longer. So our very presence is keeping this from going really far off from where it needs to be. And you go, wow, we're not doing too good of a job, are we? Well, maybe we need to step it up. But he's basically saying this. This is who you are. You're supposed to preserve this. Romans held this like in, in Jesus' day that except for the sun, salt was the most valuable thing in the world. Okay? That's how important they were. In fact, uh, soldiers would even be paid in salt. Sometimes it was that valuable. In fact, probably where you know the expression, that guy over there is not worth his what? Not worth his salt. He ain't worth him being paid. Nothing, nothing good about it. So salt was a very precious commodity back in those times. And it was all about preservation. Now, now here's the, the troubling thing. Okay, When you look at it, verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? Now, I did a little bit of research today and go, so when does salt lose its taste? Well, here, here's what I found out. Salt doesn't lose its taste. The way that it's compounded together and the, and the way that it is as a mineral, it never loses its taste. And so a lot of people go, oh, that poor Jesus. He didn't know what he was talking about when he said that. Just a little analogy. He didn't know what's going on. Actually, Jesus knew very much what he was talking about because back in those days when Jesus was speaking to these people, they'd get a lot of their salt from, say, like the Dead Sea shores and the salt would be washed up and they'd collect it. But there was also this other mineral that was nearby called gypsum. And gypsum was very clear, like salt, kind of crystal-like, and it'd be washed up on the shore at the same place. And so if you were looking at them, sometimes you couldn't even tell the difference between salt and gypsum. So what happens is you collect a huge batch of it, and all of a sudden you start selling it, and somebody would put it on food, and they go, ugh, this is absolutely gross. This salt has no taste. In reality, it wasn't the fact that the salt hadn't taste, but it had been contaminated with the gypsum. And so it, and the, guess what? The whole batch would be thrown out. And so salt cannot lose its saltiness. It simply loses its impact when it is contaminated with lesser things. You see where Jesus is going now? You are the salt of the earth. You can't lose your saltiness. But you know what? If you pour yourself out in this world and you feel like it's not producing what it's supposed to be, it's not the fact that you've lost what it is. It's that you've contaminated the whole bottle with other stuff that shouldn't be in there. That's the problem. Can I just ask you how many times that we have seen in our own lives or people that we've known who have been contaminated with lesser things and all of a sudden it gets diluted, doesn't it? You're supposed to be a vessel of this, but you fill yourself up with so much and all of a sudden it loses its saltiness. And so what happened in this is that Christians can lose their effectiveness in the kingdom when sin and worldliness literally is just completely diluting what is in there. It becomes tasteless. It becomes useless. And so what Jesus says is, if you're going to be the salt of the earth, you better be careful because if you start filling yourself up when you pour yourself out, yeah, there'll be a little bit of salt there. But they're not going to taste it. And guess what? They throw out the entire, entire thing. And, and he says this at the end of that verse. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So when Christians stop being who God has called them to be, it's like you throw out even all the good stuff with it. You're throwing out the gypsum, but you're also throwing out the salt because, oh, the whole batch is bad. Nobody wants it. In reality, it wasn't the whole batch is bad, but it being contaminated. And so what happens when Christians and churches and pastors and you name it don't do what God's called them to be, they are discarded by society because they're not fulfilling the purpose that God has called them to be. Followers who seek the role of popularity over preservation will eventually experience ruin. And this happened time and time again. Somebody comes along and they want to be uh, accepted by the culture. 
well, don't be too much, and you're just going to sort of fill yourself up with other stuff, and then when you pour yourself out, it's not that, but it doesn't even preserve anything anymore, and it's thrown out. It's trampled under the feet of men. It's completely useless. And so what Jesus is warning all of his disciples is this. If you want to be the salt of the earth, that's who you are. Don't contaminate yourself with other stuff. Don't fill yourself up with other things. Then he talks about the light. Look at verse 14 again. He says, you are, or y'all, are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and gives light to all in the house. So if you think about it this way, if you think about just the, the idea of a light, uh, I pulled out the, the oldest lamp that we have in our house. And uh, this was a gift from our family. And so I was instructed, do not drop this. So I'm going to hold on to two hands uh, with this. But this is the oldest lamp we have in our house, I laughed today as I went to go get it because it has no light bulb in it, okay? But it's sitting there on, on the counter. We, we just need to go get a light bulb for it. But I, I realize this, when any guys, when, when you're doing any kind of decorating your house or you're moving, it's like, oh, we got to get this kind of lamps. I mean, the lamp business is doing well if you haven't realized this. You got tall lamps, you got small lamps, you got lamp gumbo, you got whatever you name it, okay? It's just everything you want. There's all types of shades, there's this kind of stuff. And there's sometimes you get a lamp, right? And you put it like on the table there. And sometimes, let's just be honest, y'all have those lamps in your house that never really get turned on. They're just there for, oh, they look good. You know, it's nice to have this kind of stuff. And in fact, if you were actually going to be benefited from the light, you got to sort of get underneath the thing, right? You know, it's, it's that kind of dim light. And so what's different about our day is that we sort of, a lot of times, will get fixated on how it looks and does it fit with the decor. But back in those days, guess what? It's just dark and we need to see. <laughs> That's it. It's just completely dark. We don't care what it looks like. We're, it's dark. we got to see. Some of y'all know the difference between city dark and country dark. You know what I'm talking about? City dark is, I isn't really dark. You can see around. Country dark is, I can't see my hand and I'm frightened, okay? There's a difference. When Jesus is living, he's living in country dark. There's not street lights. There's not all kinds of stuff around. It's like, hey, we've got to see. It is dark out here. It's dangerous out here. It's scary out here. We have to do this. And so as light's primary purpose was illumination... Christian's presence is meant to illuminate the world to the ways of God. That's what's supposed to happen. And so that our role being the light of the world, if J Jesus originally said in John 8, 12, what, I am the light of the world, and if I am in you, guess what, that light should be spilling out all over the place. And the deal is this, as the lamp was supposed to provide li a light to everyone, a Christian's presence is meant to illuminate the world to the ways of God. So we are supposed to shine the light in dark places and say, this is the way to go. That's where we're supposed to be. And in reality, what can happen is instead of doing that, honestly, some of us have really nice lamp fixtures and the light bulb's not even in there. It's just not turned on. We're not using it. It's more there for decor than it is for function. And that is what's so dangerous for us. And when he, when he says in here, he says, nor, verse 15, nor do people light a lamp, put it under a basket or on a stand, it gives light to all in the house, that the greatest light coverage is always united, uplifted, and unfiltered. And so you want to think about that if all these lights together, in fact, he even says a city set on a hill cannot be what? Can't be hidden. If you've ever gone somewhere from afar and all of a sudden you're walking into this place and there's a bunch of lights together, if you've ever been in a third world country where you're, you're going in these paths and all of a sudden up on the hill you go, oh, there, there's light there. And it's not just one light. That would only do so much. But it's a bunch of lights together and it's like, oh, that, that's a safe place. And what the church is supposed to be is a bunch of lights all together that shine brighter together. And like, oh, wow, there's a safe place. Like, I, I can go there. So the lights are united. It's uplifted. So you're skimming this. We want to get it as high as we can so that people can see. It's not let me put it under a shade or put it under a basket. No, I'm going to let it shine, right? So we, we know this, but then also it's unfiltered. You don't put anything in the way of it. Don't put anything in the way of it. It's so easy for us. And so the city on a hill is exposed. It's not in hiding. It's not saying, hey, we got a light over here if you need it. It's like, no, no, we're, we're going to shine it for us. And then look at verse 16, what he says. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, that sounds completely countercultural to the way that you and I live. I would think I'm going to shine my light so that everybody looks at me and goes, whoo. I'm not going to glorify God. I'm going to glorify who? You. What an incredible light you're shining. Man, 
How do you do it? Well, you know, I've been to light school. That's what I do. You know, I, I shine it every night. I, I'm just a very wonderful person. And so what happens is you want to shine your light so that everybody goes, wow, what an incredible lamp that guy is right there. And we go, I, I know, you're right. And, and it's completely different. Jesus says this, no, 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 you should live in such a way that you shine your light as far and as bright and as long-standing as you possibly can. And the way that it's working is that people don't go, wow, what impressive bulbs. They go, wow, what an incredible God you serve. Look how you shine. Look how you shine. Jesus, even a few verses later, Matthew 6, verse 1, will say it this way, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Because if you do that, guess what? Your Father in Heaven is going to give you no reward. So what do you mean? That means that if you do things for everybody to go, hey, everybody, look at what I'm doing. I'm going to do some righteous deeds. Hey, applaud me. God goes, you enjoying that applause, boy? Good, because you ain't getting none from me. You either get his or somebody else's. Which one do you want? And so he's saying this, look, your motivation in this moment is not so that other people can see, it's so that other people would see him. That's what you want. You want it to be a literally point a light to him. And so you're going to shine your light for others. They see your good works. Glorify your Father in heaven. That's the deal. And so if we shine our lights correctly, people will praise the one we illuminate rather than the ones illuminating. That's what we want. As we collectively come together and we shine our lights and point them to a way that people can see the Lord, that they should go, wow, what a beautiful, beautiful Savior you guys have, rather than what impressive light bulbs you guys are. That's, that should be the goal. And so when we come through it, it once again, it, it's not about function. It's, it's we want to we love, we want to shine our lights. Why? So that people can be impressed by our God. And so when you look at this whole passage, he says, you're the salt, you're, you're also the light. Here's the deal. I think that he's warning, though, even though this is who you are, your identity, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, here's his warning for us. Don't contaminate the salt and don't cover up the light. I think that's what Jesus is teaching right here. Don't contaminate the salt. Don't fill it with other stuff that shouldn't be there. And don't filter the light. Don't cover it up. Don't try to hide it. And so in this, it's also beautiful when you think about it. Salt is kind of a discreet mineral, right? You kind of put it in. It's not like you necessarily see it. Unless, like, some of my children who love to pour tons of it on it, you catch it, and you actually see it, like, that's bad, right? But in reality, you shouldn't really see it. It's just kind of there. And light, is it discreet? Light's not discreet. Light is very apparent. And so what, what, look at this beautiful picture here. He's saying, I want you to be both. I want you to be kind of flying under the radar, preserving it from further decay, but I also want you standing up really t uh, high so that all can see at different times. There's places for both of them in our lives. There's places for us to sometimes be that kind of discreet. We're just sort of preserving things, keeping things at bay. And there are those times where we've got to turn the light bulb on and shine it. And so salt is more that indirect influence of the gospel. And light is more the direct communication of it as, as we're sharing it. So as we think about these concepts, what are we supposed to do as, as we handle this together as a church? And, and I want to paint a picture for you here in just a second. First thing is this. We are better together than we are on our own. If you have not realized that, I want to just go ahead and tell you that. That, once again, reminding that the you in this is plural. And that if you are staying isolated from the body of Christ, you are missing out on what God is calling us to do. For those of you, and I'm so thankful for whatever reason that you come in here to worship. I praise the Lord for that. But the beauty of the church is when we start getting to know one another and start doing life together. And we can start serving together. In reality, we're just missing out on so much. If it's just me against the world, we're just missing it. Yeah, but I love Jesus, but I got burned by the church. I get that. I totally understand. Yeah, I love Jesus, but I just don't want anything to do with the church. You cannot come to me as a pastor and say, Hey, Travis, I like you, but I just can't stand your wife. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. Well, then guess what? We've got problems now. No, no, no. I like you. I just can't stand your bride. I'm going, guess what? I don't like you now. I don't want anything to do with you. Guess what? The church is called the bride of who? Christ. And listen, I know that sometimes we've been apart and we've, we've known church members and we think it's not the bride of Christ anymore. It's more like bridezilla. I get that. I totally understand that sometimes we can behave that way. But in reality, what it should be is this. If you love Jesus, you love his church and you stay committed to his church. That's what should happen. So we're better together than we are on our own. Number two, we are unable to impact a world that is influencing us. It is hard for us to say, hey, let me pour something out. And when we do pour it out, it's, it's of no taste. Because we're being influenced, contaminated, diluted by everything else out there. And it's hard to do that when we're trying to get everybody to understand how important what we're doing is. And yet we can't even stay in that right spot. So Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says what? That by the mercies of God that we need to what? Not be conformed to this world, right? 
but be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we want to go in and we want to change. We're not going to be conformed by what the world does. We're going to go in and we're going to transform it from within. And then third, as a church, we are more effective for those on the inside when we prioritize those on the outside. I, I know that um, there are so many different flavors and different ways that we can look at church, but here's the reality. Ultimately, as, as a church, for those of you who've been here forever, and those of you who've just been here for this your first day, I uh, want to let you know something. We believe that this church, the primary audience, some churches would be the members, uh, some people would be the uh, visitors, for some churches it would be this age demographic, for some churches it would be that age demographic. Here is our target audience for this church, at least for me, okay? I hope we'll all go this. Target audience for Rocky Creek Church is this, Jesus. That's the target audience. This is for him. It's not for you or for me or whatever. When we gather together, it's ultimately for him. When we go and serve, it's ultimately for him. When we worship, it's for him. When we disciple, when we sanctify, it's for him. And so that's the goal. And so yet, but when we're there, what can happen in a church is we can become so inwardly focused, we don't know what to do with people out there. We have no idea. And I'm saying this, that our best job for those in here is when we stop just thinking about just us and start looking outside these walls and going, there are people who need to hear the gospel. And you know what? Most of them are not just going to stumble in here one Sunday and go, I'm looking for truth. Does anybody have it? And we go, hey, we've got it over here. If you want to come get it, it's on the top shelf. Reach really high. Because that's what we've done as the salt of the earth. Yeah, we've got it for you when you're ready to come get it. Ask for it. We'll come. Yep. But it's on the top shelf there. Hope you can reach. If not, you can get a stool, maybe something. This is how we've done this. We said, when you're ready, come to the shelf and get the salt for yourself. That's not how Jesus, he says you go and infiltrate that society. You get up all up in the middle of it. You sprinkle that salt everywhere you go. You shine that light everywhere you go. We're not waiting for them to come to us. This commission is not a come and see. It is a go and what? Go and tell. Go and make disciples of all nations. That's what we're called to do. And so when we think about 1 Thessalonians 2.8, I love this verse, you can just write it down, but it says that we have such a, a strong affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our very own lives. That we're just investing in people. And what happens is, this is a beautiful thing, I can remember years ago I was discipling a group of guys, and, and uh, I'd been uh, asking them to pray for a guy that I had been sharing the gospel with, and, and they had been praying for him by name, and then one night... <laughs> Uh, this guy who, he has a different name, and he, he came into our group meeting, and, and we came in, and I remember one of my friends seeing him, like, hey, my name's such and such. He's like, hey, I'm so-and-so. He goes, oh, so-and-so? Oh. <laughs> just like I thought, will you please calm down? You're going to freak the guy out. And he's just like, oh, this is the guy we've been praying for. And that night when we were doing a Bible study, everybody's act, trying to act cool but going, this is a guy who's about to walk over the line of light from death to life. And they just have their, their mindset on. And I'm saying what a beautiful thing for us as a church is, hey, let's not wait till everybody gets it figured out out there and clean up their act out there and then they come in. Why don't we bring them along along the way? Why aren't you investing in your job and your neighborhoods everywhere that you go and you're saying, hey, you don't have it all together? Neither do I. Come with me. Come with me. And I'm going to learn something today and I'm going to teach you tomorrow. That, that's how this is going to go. And so when we look at what it means to be a church, it, uh, underneath on there in your bulletin, it talks about how I need to be salt and light. And while we do this corporately, this is also an individual thing about how you're going to answer this question. And here's the reality. Some of you um, who, who know my heart know some of my story. Um, when I started just looking and trying to one day get my head around everything that Rocky Creek is about as a church, it blew me away. Blew me away. And I, I started just sharing with people the stuff that was happening here. And the way that people were serving and giving... And they're like, no way. I'm like, yeah. And so then when I'm here and I've been here for a few months, sometime I'm telling church folk and I'm saying, hey, isn't it incredible that we do this? And people go, we do that? I'm like, yeah, I didn't know. And, and so here's the danger, that as an institution, we're doing a lot. But as an individual, are you being a part of what the salt is and what the light is supposed to be? I mean, just the last few weeks, let me just... If I walk through my last few weeks here, I'm, I'm thinking about on Monday night going into David's table to seeing a group of uh, teenagers who have different type of uh, challenges and disabilities, and I'm seeing members in this church loving on these young men and women that are sometimes so on the margins of society and forgotten and neglected. And I'm being welcomed and loved by these people who are just saying thank you so much for allowing us to be here and so gracious. And these kids that are sometimes always on the fringes are getting the gospel, getting a meal, and their families are being loved on and supported. 
I, I'm thinking about getting the requests and the different things about uh, ladies that we have sent to the foreign mission field, like Rebecca, like Cassie, like Adiola, who have said, I'm going to press pause on any plans that I have other than I'm going to go take the gospel to people who have not heard it yet. And they're just going to go. I think about Holly and Berkeley who are going out into different campuses and they're reaching out into different universities and, and literally have just gone and, and you guys are supporting. I think about the church plants that this church is about, whether it's in the New England, whether it's in Georgia, uh, we have a couple, uh, there's one in Massachusetts, we have one that's getting ready and we're preparing somebody over in Anderson. We're actually helping a church plant in Greenville and you go, oh, can you do that? Isn't that competition? No. No, it's not. We're not in competition with any church. There are more than enough fish out in the sea that if all of us would just become fishers, we're not in competition. Every single church in this entire city could be filled three or four times, and there's still people out there ripe for the harvest. So no, we're not in competition. No, we want to encourage every church on this road that's preaching the gospel and say, let's encourage, let's continue to go. I think about that today we are investing in uh, men who are coming out of recovery and addiction and some of you don't even know that they are in your midst at different times. And we're loving on these guys. And, and I'm hearing incredible, incredible stories about someone who seven months ago came through this program through Miracle Hill and started coming to our church because he had to. And I can remember the night that he opens, uh, puts his hand up and says, I've got a question. And I said, what? And he didn't know what I was talking about between the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then later, when I, I help him out and I'm telling him that in the class, and afterwards he says, oh, I'm so ashamed. And I said, no, 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 I'm so glad you're here. And seven and a half months later, when he graduates, he is going to apply to be in a ministry program so he can train other people in the Bible. Like, you see this kind of stuff, like, happening. Like, that, that kind of stuff goes on for those of you who serve meals and are mentors there, for the guys that are coming up out of prison who feel like this is their church home because of the people who are going and investing in them, to the men who are going to the Perry Correctional Institute and doing Bible studies and shepherding and loving on people. When I think about, and I'm going to miss somebody, and somebody's going to later say, what about this? When I think about what's happening in Joyful Ornaments, where a group of ladies are saying, you know what? We're going to use our gifts and talents, and we're going to make ornaments, and we're going to sell them, and we're going to raise money for women in this area who are struggling with cancer. And as we do that, we're going to share the gospel with them and with their families, and we're going to get the word out for those that are suffering to say that you're not alone. And I think about those that are coming through and even with foster care and adoption and those that are getting on board and saying, you know what, we are going to say yes to whatever God's call is for us to visit orphans and widows in their distress, keep ourselves unstained by the world. When I think about the work that's going on at Piedmont Women's Center and people from this church who are going in for these crisis pregnancy centers and saying, you don't have to choose this. You can choose life. You can go forward in this. When I think about those that are individually going and making contacts at work or opening up the basketball gym and saying, hey, why don't you guys come in and play ball with us and let's, let's share a Bible study together. I think about Ernesto who's going down the hall right now who's preaching in Spanish to a group of people who sometimes are just always on the fringes and he has given his heart to it and you guys support that. When I think about Shoresh who's going to be gathering down this hall at 530 tonight and going to be investing in those who are, come from India who have come to America to get away from some of the things that they want to get away from in India. And Ernesto is trying to reach them with the gospel. And I talked with Ernesto and Shoresh this week, and I said, hey, let me, let me talk to you guys about something, and, and I want to hear your heart and, and go through some things. But I, I said, do you guys feel like, I, I just want to ask this question. I, I'm new. I'm a rookie. I'm trying to get my head around this. Do you feel like you're using this building, or are we in ministry together? Because those are two different things. What do you feel, brothers? Tell me. Tell me the truth. And both of them saying, we're in this together. We're going to the same place. We have the same mission. Like, thank you for letting us use this building, but we want to partner so much more than what we're doing. And I'm just telling you guys this. The harvest is plentiful. Sometimes, though, the workers are few. And, and, and my thing is this. If I could give you guys any application, and, and I really want you to pray through it this way is, is there a person in your life right now that you need to be salt and light to? I'm going to go ahead and tell you the answer is yes. Okay? Yes. And you're going to be in places and areas this week that I'll never get the chance to. And my question is this, is that will you just go and just brag on Jesus? Bring him along with you. Hey, I'm trying to follow the Lord. Just come along with me. Let me teach you what I've got. Is there an area? I've just mentioned a few of the ones that we're connecting with. But I didn't even talk about the stuff that there are those right now that feel a call to go and rock babies down the hallway. And they're doing an incredible thing right now. An incredible work. 
that, that children are growing up saying that, you know what, the church is a safe place that loves me and tells me about Jesus. Like, those, those are incredible works that you can't even put a price tag on. You have people, so, so maybe there's an area of a person that you need to say, I need to start investing in. But also some of you, here's the reality. I think some of us need to get off the sidelines. And I think it's great that we've been cheering on the institution, but it's time for us to start getting in the game. It's time for us to start serving. It's time for us to say, Travis, it's flawed, and I think y'all should probably do it this way, better than that way, you know, blah, blah, blah. But this ain't a cruise ship. It's to carry the troops out. And, 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 and my, my challenge today is this. God, you got the keys. I'm willing to go to do whatever you ask. I'm in. You drive. I'm right with you and whatever it's called to be. So I want to pray that we would respond to that today. Let's pray together now. Jesus, I would ask that in this moment, that as we come together as a family, that you would remind us of the great truth that we have in the gospel, and that while we are saved, and um, we operate from your love, we do not operate for your love. We already have it. We have been given a wonderful opportunity to serve you in any way that you see fit. And so, Lord, um, I am asking that as a church, that in this moment that we could be grateful for what you've done in the past, the decades upon decades upon decades of faithful people who have taken the gospel to this area. Lord, we didn't really mention how we got trips that are going to West Africa and to Brazil and different places like that that are going and taking the gospel. They're all over the place. So I'm thankful for all the work that has been done in the past. But Lord, I am asking, you have said that if my burden right now is that the harvest is way plentiful, that there's there's too many things to be done than we possibly can even get at. If the workers are few, you have said, Jesus, through your mouth what we need to do. And you have not said for us to do a volunteer campaign, to do a crazy amount of sign-up sheets. You have said pray. And so that's what we're going to do right now. We want to pray, we want to beseech, we want to uh, plead before the Lord of the harvest that you would send out more workers into your harvest. That for some of us right now going, but yeah, I don't have enough time, I pray that we would get stuff off the schedule to get your kingdom work on the schedule, whatever that is. Lord, the stuff that is just going to be by chance, by way of life, that we're just doing as we're going about our, our daily task. But also for those of us who say, no, no, I'm going to invest. I'm going to get off the sidelines. I'm going to serve. I want to be a part of what is this salt and light. Lord, there is a world that is going in decay, and it is dark, and it needs salt. It needs light. So, Lord, I am thankful to be a part of a church that makes us a priority as an institution. But I am asking for more individuals to step up and say yes. Lord, may you have the keys. May you have every right to take us wherever we go. We have seen you high and lifted up. We know what our sins deserve us of. And we are forgiven. And so, Lord, there is no place too hard, too far, too difficult to do. Not for your love, but from your love. We want to love. So, Lord, I am asking, I'm pleading, as a church, would you convert us from a cruise line mentality to a wartime mentality. Would you mobilize the troops? Would you send us out? We are asking, Lord, the harvest, send more workers out. In Jesus' name, amen. What I want to do is I want to ask all of us to stand right where we are. We're going to sing as a way to just sort of uh, observe and celebrate this thought about what we're doing. But I'm also going to ask if any of you would want to just come right now to the altar. I'm going to just come down here personally and just pray that that prayer. Lord, would you send more workers into your harvest? So if you want to join me by praying there or down here at the altar, we just want to pray that the Lord will continue to send us out. You give life. You are love. You bring
That's where this is heading. Um, it, it's a beautiful thing to think about that one day, from every tribe, every nation, every tongue represented there. The work that's going to be done at David's table tomorrow, the work that's being done in the preschool ministry right now, the work that's going to be done in West Africa as we send the team next month, all of that is included in this. And, and so, um, my thing from you since day one, for those of you who've been here when I did a trial sermon, is God don't need any of us but he's inviting us. Isn't that beautiful? I'm so thankful he's not scared and frantic right now. He's got this control. So the invitation today is not to say, guys, we need some people. It's you're missing out on the most incredible thing in the world, following your father to work every day. And so here's a simple way to respond uh, for, for any of us, and then we're going to be done. Uh, there's next step cards in every pew there in front of you, and, and one of them is to step out that every week we're asking people to, that maybe today you go, okay, I want to hit step out, and I don't know what that means yet, we'll help you figure it out. <laughs> that, that's what we do, okay? If you're just saying, I don't know what it is, but I want to say yes, here are the keys, I, I'm ready to go, I follow, easiest way to fill that card out. If there's anything else on there, fill it out today, you can drop it off on the boxes as you leave. Uh, and Father, I just ask, um, calmly and patiently I ask, not frantic at all, because my Father's not frantic. Lord, the opportunities that we have this week as an institution, as an organization, but also individually are stifling. The nations are coming to us. We have access to go to all the nations. There are more opportunities for us to take gospel witness in this community and to the ends of the world than we even know what to do with. So the, the needs are and the opportunities are there. Sometimes the workers are few. So Lord, you have used everything some of the most unlikely candidates you have used even a donkey to get your message out before us and, and so Lord I am asking that for that we would be protected from a spirit that we have to figure it all out or we have to be something special Lord we need to be we are the salt and the light may we just be that this week for those that need to respond and need some help to find what that next step is I pray that they'd have the, the courage to do that and as we go forth uh, every restaurant that we're going into today, every gas station, every workplace tomorrow has people who need to hear the truth. May we be that salt. May we be that light. In Jesus' name, amen.